this is a session, quite an important topic, which is we're in this transition from the industrial era to the technology era. And we find ourselves in that place where the industrial models of everything, doing business, wealth creation, how we conduct our relationships in trade and so on, are all about to be challenged. And as a result, there has to be something that replaces it. And it has to be timely and it has to be highly impactful. And what that is and what shape it might take, we're, we're going to briefly explore today. We have for you a very interesting panel. I'll just introduce myself and then the panel. I'm Katan Patel. I'm a member of the Board of Trustees of the World Academy of Art and Science. Um, I'm also the chair of something called Force for Good, which works in support of the UN Secretary General's uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And our overall aim is to look at how we create a more secure, sustainable and superior future. Given the technologies that are being innovated and launched now and the ones we can expect, it should be possible to actually achieve a superior future, not just one that is secure and sustainable, but superior in the sense that everyone is elevated across the whole world. Our report on technologies of force for good as a partner of the World Academy kind of shows that actually the, the ability to use technology to change the world is something real and existing technologies can close nearly 50% of the SDG gap. If only we took what existed and rolled it out across the world at some scale. So it's, a, it's an exciting endeavor, of course, to see if we can actually get that done. And with that in mind, we have a very interesting panel for you. Um, the panel itself has um, three generations. We have um, an individual at least that is over 80, has crossed 80. We have one that has crossed 60, and uh, we have one that has crossed 30. We'll have three different perspectives from three different sets of careers. And I'll begin by, by introducing um, Dr. Rajan. Dr. Rajan uh, is a physicist, a professor, a senior government administrator, uh, a businessman and advisor and an author. He was uh, a senior individual in the Indian space program for over two decades. He crosses technology and business and education. He's been awarded the President's uh, Prize in India or award in India called the Padma Shri, one of the fourth, uh, one of the highest civilian awards in India. We also have um, Yi Chen Zhang. Um, Yi Chen is uh, somebody who graduated in Germany, worked previously as, as the head of various multinational chemical and construction material companies. Uh, across international horizons. He's a senior consultant to financial institutions, particularly in clean coal energy and hydrogen production, as well as carbon neutrality. Um, he's been a professor at Tongji University in Shanghai and founded the Institute of Eco Innovation, um, an expert in really in the field of energy, ecology, uh, and also is a fellow of the World Academy of Art and Science. I have Glenn Gaffney with us too. Um, he's an American James Bond equivalent of the character called Q. He was a former director of science and technology at the CIA, has worked in the US intelligence services, left that to do venture investing and uh, implementing change to fill the gaps between research and development uh, of new companies and products. He's highly decorated, including two presidential rank awards two National Intelligence Distinguished Service Medals, three CIA Director Awards, and two CIA Distinguished Service Medal Awards. We have Annika Rao Manori, the youngest of the group. Um, she is the founder and uh, CEO of CLI AI, a generative AI model uh, and business. She's an AI tech entrepreneur, formerly also a blockchain entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur across many fields, also worked at Goldman Sachs, and her college thesis led her to um, do something for CERN. In answering a competition at university to predict the price of the Bitcoin uh, and win 300 pounds, she went on to create a business in blockchain that saw her recognized by Forbes um, as 30 under 30, which means 30 notable young people under the age of 30 who can make a difference to the world. So it's a fantastic panel, a dynamic, interesting, fantastic panel. And we have three sets of questions that we're going to explore today. Um, I'll begin like this. The first, and I will pose it to Glenn. 
and we'll talk about the challenges with each of them. And I'll ask all of you to be really brief. We have 50 minutes in total. We'll try and keep to time given someone else will be taking over as soon as we finish. So the first question I have really is for you, Glenn. Um, what are the biggest issues you see facing the world where technology can make a difference? Hard to come up with a, a short answer to the, the, all of the challenges that are out there, but I'm going to focus on two that I think are really important um, in the near term, uh, and that's energy um, and uh, digital infrastructure. Uh, and I focus on energy and digital infrastructure because they are critical enablers of so many of the other things that would need to be addressed. So when I think about things like food security, for example, um, and I think about some of the great research and some of the breakthroughs that are coming that are on the horizon for the development of new proteins and new approaches uh, that will help in the food security area, one of the fundamental limiters that have to be solved in order to make those price point effective or move forward is solving the energy problem. When I think about things like um, AI and all the enabling that AI will do, there's a big energy piece right associated with that. So energy and digital infrastructure are two, I think, of the near-term challenges that will unlock so much of the other things that need to be addressed under the SDG goals. And, and clearly, we're in a transition of energy sources from oil and gas to something far more renewable, and hopefully in the future, something far more powerful and cheaper and functional that would allow us to include everybody else in the world. Um, I'm gonna come back to you, Glenn, later and ask you what you've seen in that field that makes a huge difference. But um, if, if I can ask uh, you, you, you please, um, uh, Yi Hang, uh, would you mind telling us, it, this is your field too, what do you see that is important in the field of energy that is making a difference? And what are the big challenges that you see? Um, I just want to make one point maybe clear in the in upfront is that uh, in the past we treat a fossil as, and uh, uh, when the uh, when the uh, when when we treat that uh, fossil as as a as a uh, energy source in the past, it is actually not exactly what you do that today. And I think a tool or a, a, a material instead of resources of energy. So it's a carbon and hydrogen source. And uh, with that in mind, then we can change the whole thing. But at the same time, I think uh, uh, in the last the past 10 years, also the fossil um, has changed the role um, um, uh, very obviously. Many people doesn't see that, but it is uh, quite true. And I have made quite a, a number of studies on that. And um, well, um, we, if you want us, if you want to listen to that, we can dig into that too. But main part is that it is a source of carbon and hydrogen. Yeah, interesting. Um, Rajan, what, what do you see as the challenge that technology should be addressing for us? What is the big challenge? Actually, as Glenn said, there are multiples of them. I won't be able to, at least sure. four or five of them are very, very critical. But I will quickly say one thing. While the greatest savior is going to be AI on one side, on the other side of it is, it is having a lot of, I always call technology as multi-edge. There are things in AI which can, which will destabilize the societies as we have to, this one was there, human security, fear it gives, give terrorism, and the democracy cannot exist. There are so many problems and interference with, the, there are so many things like that. We need to find out solutions for it. It is possible. I have some solutions, suggestion. Uh, so that is one item very critical. Then I, I will, next one will be water. Water, all forms of management of water. Then I am skipping some. Then Third, very important one will be how to get the digital infrastructure and variety of them, how to get some distributed manufacturing, which will ensure that low-skilled people can still get jobs, not subsidies, not doles. So that's the way it can be done. Actually, AI has got the potential for it. And then there are so many other things which we discussed offline in the, this one, which so these are the three things, distributed manufacturing to ensure that even the very low skills, it is not only in the, the, develop, the developing, other thing will be water management. Third thing will be taming the 
AI, transfer AI, I won't even call it taming. It is very good to have AI to do things for betterment of society. To, uh, to see to it that the beginning itself, things are bad, things are culled out. Not after that. Bad things can be should be culled out before they are in worked upon. Is possible. At least I guess it is possible. This I these are the things on which people should work. Very very interesting because it's a, it's clearly a multi-dimensional problem in terms of who decides what is dangerous and what isn't what is truth and what is lies and so on, and the role of the state in that, and the role of the tech companies, and so on. Annika, let, and we're going to come back to that. Annika, let me ask you the question. What, what do you see as the biggest, uh, or some of the big challenges that technology needs to address? Yeah, I think uh, the biggest uh, challenge there is um, it, that technology can help solve is, um, right now, the economy is still uh, kind of run... Um, or it exists as it were before technology could really impact the distribution of power. Um, before, you know, it, it, monopolies win um, and they do a lot of things inefficiently um, and smaller companies um, get kind of constricted in growth because they're, they're too small and they can't, they can't compete with those resources. I think technology can facilitate, like the guys have been saying about digital infrastructure, it can facilitate a trade environment um, where multiple small companies can work together and each one of them can be extremely efficient um, and, and work together to create that same kind of um, power, except there's more um, distribution of it and um, there's more equality and, um, you know, there's there's uh, more specialization, which leads to actually better quality. Thank you. That's a, that's a great headline. I'm going to pull that together and ask now us to move to saying practically what is it that should happen in terms of high impact innovation. And um, Annika, why, why don't you continue that thread? Because you're absolutely right. Most of the wealth has been monopolized of course, in the largest corporations, and of course, in, in the wealthiest of countries. But that, of course, means that two thirds of the world have not been beneficiaries of, of so much of the progress that has been made in the world. They don't get the medications, they don't get the clean water, they don't get the jobs, they don't get the technologies and the education and so on. There's so many things missing. So how, how will technology make this big difference so that smaller micro and medium-sized enterprises and entrepreneurs can benefit. Yeah, I think um, it's a it's a good question, and it's certainly not just. I, I mean, my comment on this that I've learned over the last um, couple of weeks certainly is um, innovation isn't just about delivering the technology; it's about implementing it. And um, and and one of the biggest challenges um, and and innovations that need to need to kind of exist is how to how to advance implementation, how to advance society faster in terms of like actually adopting these different things. So I can tell you, for example, um, you know, right now supply chains are typically like five massive companies. Um, if you had a bunch of small companies doing different things and you use the blockchain, for example, to regulate the trade between them, that would take a, that would automate and take and you know, like reduce the cost of inter-business um, trade and communication. And so it would facilitate that kind of that kind of growth. Um, AI can um, you know take over a lot of the kind of um, and 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 frankly, uh, probably do it better as well. Um, you know, a lot of like the, the kind of procurement um, uh, due diligence and the kind of um, you know, a, a, like acquiring of clients and things like that to kind of start attaching these <clears throat> suppliers. So you can use these technologies to lower the cost of implementing a system like this, but ultimately people still have to adopt it. Um, and that's that's where the I think the the real challenge lies and where innovation is needed um, and where we need to do something practically. People are more complicated than the technology to actually <laughs> make something happen. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Basically, yeah. all these complicated people getting in the way. You're absolutely right, there. <laughs> and that is the source of so many challenges. Glenn, would you reflect on that too, please? Because you talked about the digital infrastructure being important. Um, and I'll come on to Rajan for that too, because there's a common thread here between the three of you on this. Glenn. Yeah, I, um, thank you. And, and yes, to build on Annika's point, um, I think there's a real opportunity here and I'm seeing some of the leading edge pieces um, uh, from some of the in, uh, action and interaction from the UN. 
But I think there's real opportunity for us to think about um, what I've referred to as uh, international proving grounds uh, around some of these key technical areas where we bridge not just the prototyping and development and create infrastructure that that startups like Annika's and others right in this space can actually band together and work these problems. But we also bring in the social scientists and we also bring in the people, right, at local, regional, and then global, right, infrastructure levels to actually look at the adoption issues, right? What is it going to take for this technology to be adopted, to have the impact at that local level, at that regional, at that global level? An example that I often use when I talk about this is things like touchless medicine, right? Um, great things are, develop are are happening in the field, right, of medicine and um, remote medicine, touchless medicine, and the way that things can be developed and go forward. If we let the standard market forces drive, we know exactly who's going to be the test market in those places. But what does it look like if we actually change and have proving grounds, have adoptable um, uh, uh, access for local environments that aren't normally the ones who are part of that market survey or that market study that then launches that technology? We'll learn not, we'll have a local impact and a regional impact but we'll also learn as entrepreneurs, manufacturers, developers of a whole different dimension to market, right? Um, that then will actually, you know, lift the overall quality of life and ability for uh, folks in general across the board. And so um, prototyping these things, whether it's touchless medicine or it's AI and thinking about what does it mean to actually use it at that local level and then employ it, what is a degree of accessibility and, and acceptability, right, within a particular locality or a region, then creates a different paradigm by which we develop these things going forward. Interesting, uh, because um, let, let, just one more part to that. Is it scalable to do it that way? compared to how we do it now? It depends on what you mean by scale. Um, and so if, if you're, if scale means sales, right, and return on investment, the way that we do it now is hard to beat, right? Yeah. If we think about scale of a fully developed product in the old world <laughs> or current yeah. world view, as Annika referred to it, um, uh, then, then you let market forces drive. And market force, I, look, I've got nothing wrong. With, I've got nothing against market forces. I'm, but I'm saying for these key technology areas that we think are so important for us as humans on this planet working together, um, adopting a different approach that scales at a human level and an applicability level not only right provides that impact near term, but also informs us right as a group to think about how we do this differently. It, so it depends on what we're scaling for. And I think um, in some cases, our desire to um, drive consumership up um, has left the impact points and those that are su that suffer from a digital divide to continue to suffer in that digital divide. Let me, let me pick that up with Rajan. Rajan, and people, how do we get people to adopt at scale and feel in this transition of technologies to, to still feel worthwhile in how they adopt. You mentioned that even old fashioned, low skill manufacturing jobs are important because some people might be approaching that for the first time in, in terms of formal employment, but how do we make it easier to execute these Actually, sort of massive rollouts? Sorry. Actually, you look at any technology which has really spread out space technology, nuclear technology, or any one of them, if you really look at them, there is a big input chain, big, big output chain, and all of them are clusters. Some of the clusters are not even technologies or something which have been your administrative system. I give you one example of this in the context of digital infrastructure itself. See the COVID, very high technology, at the, that level and then doing it, handling it, etc. But delivery, I have seen it in India, I was amazed. Seeing it down in the ordinary public health system, a little girl stands who would have been either 10th pass or 12th standard pass. She has a phone, nothing very great, the same little phones which we use. Don't worry, the COVID platform had not been there 
you traditionally will have to write down who got it or who did not get it, who cheated it. It's a completely it works so well that without the digital infrastructure, you do not have to work. At the same time, these ordinary people, low skilled, things are to be maintained. So this is true for several other things also. Space technology, I know how those things get done in our country itself. Disaster warning, disaster management. Very ordinary loudspeaker people say, oh, things are there. So these type of things, one has to think. Because people only think space, oh, God, Mars. This similarly, pharma, mRNA technology. It is not, yeah, they are all very important. If mRNA technology and all were not there, it would not have come. But at the same, there are trigger points. Around them, so many are there. The clusters and the supply chain. And within the supply chain, there will be clusters. That is where we will be able to do things. I have seen it when, when it was delivered for COVID. And it has been delivered certain other things also. In India, 10 rupees, which is a very low level, you put that QR code, tuck. The, giving the QR code to the hawker level is done by very ordinary fellows. They know some technology. So if you look at it that way, and anybody uses it, so, digital is a great enabler in putting all these together. That is where I said, AI can handle this huge thing which comes. So many things going on. Today, we are not able to conceptualize. Those things can be brought in into it because it can deal with a large amount of things, ordinary things and also big things. So, if we have that attitude, that very ordinary thing is also same thing will be in agriculture variety of them i can go on i have seen it quite a bit of things working so it is that which gives that scale up ordinary little fellow he won't know that he is scaling up to that level hmm. he gives it she gives it somebody else but overall if you look back it's a big scale up countrywide but also even beyond countries is possible yeah. and I am able to see it, visualize it because I, I put in some of these pieces because now one advantage for me is I don't have to immediately deliver so I can look back and then see how these things are. So yes. that is that is what a great advantage which we have. It can be done for transport, it can be done for everything. Transport in India everywhere, the tolls it goes off. Fast time my car checking I get a, this thing that is because the digital infrastructure was put in. Otherwise, yes. it would not. So, digital infrastructure is crucial. Along with that, this conceptualizing of the scale is necessary. But you have to disaggregate them to the lowest thing, which will absorb also ordinary people into the job. And it is possible. It requires a little bit of a mindset change. No, everything will be done only by this. Leave it to market. I am not against market forces at all. They are very critical. But say that I will leave it only to market forces will be a lot of valleys of death and we can avoid it. Preempt. Let, let, me, let me bring Yi Hang in because here's somebody you know who has experienced the power of the state transforming a country and the rise of the entrepreneur meeting the state somewhere. Um, and a country now, of course, in China that is on some dimensions, extremely advanced, and other dimensions still developing and growing. Yi Hang, what do you see as um, innovation and how it can make a difference to us achieving these, these goals, the sustainable development goals, um, and raising the world? Thank you. Uh, I, I, I could be uh, dropped off again. I mean, um, I'm, I'm trying very much. It's not because of the technology. It's because someone is uh, controlling. <laughs> anyway, um, what I'm trying to say is um, uh, actually what I see as a, a need of the alternative AI or try to differentiate that in the AI, it's in two parts. Part number one, which has been uh, uh, pursuit in the past uh, over 30 years is precision, is um, optimization. And that part is definitely with digital, with a lot of data, 
or when we call that as a kind of controlling according uh, to what parameters are exactly set. And uh, this has been done uh, not only in the Western world, but also in China. But the, mo the critical part is the first part. The first part means um, the HI, a human with the artificial in intelligence. And that has been actually uh, uh, making not many progress. Basically, uh, that part is actually more holistic and uh, instead of precision. Basically, we want to see the, the where is the problematic and, this, and, and, and make a kind of uh, justification with semi-empirical semi -empir empirical, uh, understanding. And uh, that part is actually, uh, I see not much uh, progress until today. Uh, was surprisingly, but it has happens like that. So in China, you can see that in many areas are uh, very similar now to Western world. So from my part in the chemical industries, we see uh, the chemical parks are uh, working exactly as uh, Ludwigshafen in Germany or in Antwerpen and, and nicely and, and uh, well done. But uh, on the other hand, there are still many things are man-made it's still according to the experience and 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 the empirical things, and and from that part, uh, such kind of uh, let's say uh, ling uh, neuro linguistic uh, that kind of combination or nerve systems didn't really help much in, in that aspect. And we are trying to uh, find a way, uh, even to avoid that kind of resistance using computer assisted job, and that is very interesting to me. And and it's is currently done. So basically, uh, this is one part. And the other part is, of course, China um, is moving forward. And uh, until now, uh, China is uh, 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 learning from the Western world. And all the standards are set by the Western world. Now, the question is, when China become um, towards number two or number one uh, in, the, in the economic uh, you know, size, and is that uh, China ready to take over the, the position and lead uh, the um, um, science and technology and whatever uh, that, that the rest and um, and 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 it, without actually any prejudice without any you know um, predecided uh, factors so that is a kind of uh, challenge also uh, for China of course at the end well, we when we say that uh, innovation is for good or Innovation needs a good intention from the beginning. So I think it's more important is that you have a good intention from the beginning. Thank you. Gitan, could I- um... I'm actually gonna ask Glenn to pick up on that because Glenn, what, you, what you've just heard is something that was part of your core job and something I know you have thoughts on. Yeah, we, we identified in the Force for Good report 19 core technologies that would be heavily competed for. It included AI, included space technologies, fusion, uh, there are so many aspects, but there were 19 core technologies. I know you've read the report, but I know you have your own views about this too. Um, the security challenge and the, com and the competition for these 19 core technologies, which are heavily competed for where America leads today, where China probably is the largest investor uh, of any state in the world. Uh, and it's the private sector in America that, that has allowed America to be the leader, well supported by government, I know, um, relative to the rest of the world. How do you see this playing out? And can it be constructive, despite the competition, to deliver a better outcome for the rest of the world? Um, I think it can be, and I think it has to be, um, for all the reasons um, that uh, Rajan was talking about uh, uh, earlier about you know the market forces uh, um, and you know, he and I are in complete agreement about that. I think the I think the state states can and should have um, a more deliberate role uh, in buying down some of the risks associated um, with moving these key technologies through to adoption. Um, and I think there's a great example. Um, Rajan talked about um, the pandemic uh, and the development of viruses. We saw states come together and buy down uh, buy down risk in the development of vaccines in a pre-competitive phase 
which asks you and sharing in a pre-competitive phase uh, in buying down that risk, actually then speeding the development and um, and sharing and distribution uh, of vaccines uh, around the world as a near as, as a as an example, a near term example of what it looks like for states to engage with entrepreneurs and uh, buy down risk uh, through uh, with industry. I believe that there are opportunities and that the, that there's work to be done in each of these key areas that the report has identified that we believe are critical uh, for the future of the sustain, sustainable development goals. And then together coming around, coming uh, governments, entrepreneurs, right, um, investors coming around and saying, what does it look like to buy down risk in these key areas to move these things forward and do it um, for not just the big companies, but for the op to create opportunity for new integration, new entrepreneurs, new invention to come together in this integrative style, begin to feed into this overall infrastructure. Um, because that's where you begin to get scale at that local level in a whole different way uh, from that perspective. But we have to be deliberate about buying down some of the key risks in, uh, in these critical areas. And I believe there's opportunity for states to come together and do that together. It looks like Rajan has something he wants to add. Rajan, would you please, um, in terms of states working together, but also Actually, given your experience in the space program, would you also reflect a little bit on India actually doesn't rank on innovation, yet has implemented huge change in the financial system, for example, using the ID system and inclusion, and is implementing massive change across the country without having necessarily innovated new core technologies. But what is your reflection on this need for competition but collaboration? I will come to that, but I also want to say a few things which said sure. towards the end. What is required is the intention is not intention before starting. I will come to that after that, after replying to what you said. Yes. The, the space technology itself was considered for India not for competitive one in the market. Now they are getting a little bit, the strategic dimension is there, but the beginning was for education, reaching to so many places, villages, 600,000 villages, and remote sensing, variety of them. It is that intent. Therefore, with that, steadily it was on that. There were the demands for doing this, doing science, astrophysics, that thing, it was demand on that. So, that's how it is done. Now, coming to the other side, what you said, the innovation index, I don't give much credence to it because they put too many parameters, how many patterns you did, how many did things, etc., etc. Whereas, because overall, India's resources are limited. It can't do everything. But this is where they did not bother. Have I put in the highest in the nanotechnology to get a little extra mark? How many papers came? Instead of that, as you said about financial sector, if you don't include financial sector, you can't do removal of poverty and all. Because in between, there was corruption. When you start giving subsidies, there was a corruption. Therefore, first and foremost was done was, that one is a state subsidy, if you look at it. Banks won't open for a poor person because maintaining a passbook and then doing it. Therefore, the government said, I want all Indians, man, woman, will get a passport because Jan Dan, people's wealth. They have zero money in the bank, but they have a passbook, they have an ATM card. In that, they could directly transfer the subsidies when it is to be done, etc., etc. So, therefore, financial sector was very crucial. Then, along with that, authentication is necessary. So, that Aadhaar, which was their identification, people are telling, some people are telling human rights, privacy, etc. But that was used. So, you can identify to whom the benefit goes because people are multiply using. So, the entire finance sector was crucial not only for upper part of it, but for delivering for the poorer sections of the country. So that became a crucial goal. Then it could be done, we be put in transport, etc., etc. That is so, in other words, there was a deliberate choice. How he did, who did it, I don't know. But that was a deliberate choice to go towards that. 
now i will quickly take because the time is running out because i wanted to tell about the ais this thing he said about chen beautifully said it is the intention to start what the intention to start actually we all get into problem of ideology but in my this thing itself i have said that is we have to eradicate ideological biases we will have ideology but when i am doing something you should not get into the bias ideological biases and infuse compassion in all the competitive activities i don't want them to be leave out everything etc so how to do that the possibilities exist only now up to now it was all in the realm of philosophers the possibilities do so in the modern world with our own modern tools i find a possible way through the jaina seven value system that is what happens is up to now those machines the big ones which are done they say do this all the models have got ideological biases if i do one i will put my bias but even for a selection of technologies maybe i will do something so to remove it how do you do you have to have a beginning itself not just yes, no so how do they do it Uh, is that the, the what is that? It is called Shad Shadwada, and I am I am not a specialist in it. But great statisticians of India, Mahabalanese, and then even many foreign scientists have worked on it. Say it has a qualitative one to modern statistics. This is done two thousand years ago. Uh, uh, some quotes: The Jaina hold that no affirmation or judgment is absolute. No affirmation or uh, Uh, judgment is absolute uh, absolute in nature each is true in its own limited sense and only for each of them it is okay there are seven alternatives for anything one is maybe it is maybe it is not maybe it is and it is not maybe it is indeterminate maybe it is and also indeterminate maybe it is not and also indeterminate maybe it is and it is not and also indeterminate now the thing is that maybe itself does not connote the full name so i don't want to get into the detail there if they are given indeterminate itself can be indescribable in inexpressible indefinite we come across so many things in our life so here what can be done is this comes very close to modern stochastic things so if this can be built in suppose ideology i say that this is bad somebody says no 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 these are some aspects of it so if these things can be built only ai can catch these multiple things it need not be given here all the type one zero so this if it can be done big tech can do there are many young people that's why i was said in the beginning also people in the uh, generation of uh, anika they can do it you have to build it in in the beginning itself before the model is given for the okay. ai that's what Thank it you. is i'm going to seven pause possibilities and... seven possibilities of anything not a one yes or no okay i'm going to pause that's... you there and actually anika you you've heard the other generations on this call speaking about the role of the state um how things get rolled out the role of the markets how important finance might be to get things pushed out the ecosystems the clusters of technology what is really the answer um i do have an answer actually i think uh, i don't know if it's good, good or not <laughs> uh but you know i realized as i was listening to everyone talk um is that ultimately like what's missing and what's um you know like how do you get that 60% of the world or whatever like those entrepreneurs how do you get them power and it's with data and i think the role of the government is to open up data and open up um the infrastructure like basically make everything visible to people you know uh real time like so the indian government can kind of do this now because of their um, authentication system and because of the financial system but you know everything is able to be public um everything is able to be mined and the only way that you know a budding entrepreneur or you know some like you know people on their own or whatever can really get a competitive advantage is by taking advantage of the data and have the truth in front of them that they can then use and they can build a business that 
has an arbitrage um, <clears throat> because they were able to look at something in a different way. And the problem I think now with the world and with governments working together and all those sort of things is that everything is like lies built on lies, built on other lies and misinformation and stuff. So if you are able to just open up, you know, what's actually happening, um, I think then you would be able to fix a lot of these problems. Now, thank you. Now, you're revolutionary at heart, I know, and that comes out <laughs> in what you just said. Um, we are in the last three to five minutes. And um, 30 seconds only, please, your your closing thought. Um, and I, I will start with Yi Heng, please. So, Yi Heng, we can't hear you. Um, I still have to yeah, recapture. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> okay. 30 so, seconds. Um, well, to me, it's, um, yes, uh, Digit. The, the last question about the the the, the truth or the digit or digit part is interesting. You are still not catching the, all the facts. So basically, it is still a kind of, of empirical world, and you are judging uh, um, by yourself. Basically, if you are capable to get all the informations, and still um, you have to judge it whether this information are correct or not. Well, this is a challenge. And AI won't help you on that part. So it's still an humanity. And uh, when I talk about the original part of the human, look at that. It's still compassion and love. I hope that uh, will create the basis for us. Wonderful. That's a wonderful thought. Thank you. Um, Ranjan, the 30-second version of your takeaway for us. Okay, Shengas, Shengas beautifully said it. You can use it. We have to bring the yachai, the human intelligence or human emotion, rather yachi. That should be brought in into the system, which means you go to the vagina, some other thing, etc. It is not one yes or no. Try to make it into that, and that can be built in. Only AI can do. Otherwise, you have to only contemplate and then do it. AI can democratize it, can do it. I envisage that in another five years, people will be able to show some models which are not biased, which can say that I have considered all these opinions before making this. That is possible. Mm -hmm. That is what one should try. But that doesn't mean that all other challenges which are talked about, we can yes. drop it and then be only on that. Sure. They are all there. But this one yes. will help it and then jump together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Glenn. All right, starting my stopwatch. Um, a couple of things. Um, one, um, Annika's point, I think, is a great one on opening up data and sharing knowledge um, around uh, what has been learned uh, throughout these last uh, multiple years, but also just um, democratizing, getting the information out there and making it accessible. Uh, and this is a real challenge. Um, because the monetization of data and the ownership of data and the conditioning of data has been tied to real profit models. And it's going to have to be, <clears throat> we have to actually set a higher ideal to overcome it. And, and um, Yi Chang's point about compassion and love and, the, and what, what the point is here, I think is really important. And I've just blown my 30 seconds, so I, so much for my stopwatch. Um, really important but doable because we're about to enter into a period where machines are going to produce more data than the humans have produced the data and how that what happens in that space and how we make that data available and for use uh, is going to be is going to be critically important if we have the higher order ideals that we have been set that have been set before us uh, in the SDG goals and we actually think about scaling impact in that space, we will do things differently in that space. My last comment um, is when we're talking about the development of new infrastructure and digital infrastructure to enable all of these things, I see a real opportunity for us to design security of these networks in from the beginning rather than building the networks and then trying to bolt security solutions on afterwards. And so I think there's an opportunity to actually leapfrog a whole generation of securing infrastructure for people, for the betterment of people, right? Because we have an opportunity to build it from the ground up. 
wonderful thought. This leapfrog idea is a wonderful thought. Um, last word to Annika. Um, tell me. Um, I would just say 97% of the world's data is not accessible and not usable to other people's minds. Um, AI is generating like opinions and content based on 3% of data. The rest of it's like shoved and stored and, and lost in like big enterprises. And we have to unlock that if we want technology to do good. Thank you. Very succinctly put too. I'm going to draw it together and, and thank you all for sharing in such a succinct manner uh, and a small time frame for us here, some very important thoughts. We've touched on clustering technologies for innovation. The overriding theme seems AI in this discussion too. The need for, the need for AI to unlock the individual level collaboration for small enterprise and individuals. Uh, we touch ever so briefly on energy and its importance and water. Um, the need for, for collaboration across boundaries, particularly uh, the underlying theme seems to be China and its rise to number one or two economy in the world and America and its superiority currently in technologies and the need for us to essentially have to work together to solve the problems. And implementation being innovation, not only scientific breakthroughs and writing papers, the importance of the financial sector is a delivery agent, um, intention, not ideology, as a, as a cornerstone value, the need to walk a middle path rather than stick to I'm right or, or, or I'm wrong or you're wrong and the yes and no path. And where we ended seemed to be democratizing of data to um, create an open environment for, for innovation and the possibilities of that for allowing us to leapfrog where we've been to a, to a whole generation to somewhere much superior to where we are. And I, I, I like, very much like that thought as the, as the end thought, which is compassion and love. And the interesting idea that AI somehow will code that in for us. Um, it sounds like a whole topic to explore that last thought, uh, the importance of compassion and love and how AI might actually help us advance that rather than create the, the security dangers that we all feared when we started this conversation. Thank you very much.